This morning, I'm going to be in Micah chapter 6, a very familiar verse. And if you have your scripture and want to open up to that, um, we're going to be talking about encouraging fathers, encouraging our fathers. And, you know, it's, it's good to be a man. I mean, I love being a man. And I, 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 isn't it men? Is it, is it encouraging to be a man? Do you like being a man? Amen. Amen. And some of you women might be asking, well, why is that? Why would anybody want to be a man? But uh, let me tell you, let me tell you why. You know, our phone conversations are over in about 30 seconds flat. I mean, that's a good reason right there. You know, a five-day vacation uh, requires only one suitcase. You know, if it's shorter than that, you can get by with a Walmart bag, you know. You know, when clicking through the channels, as a man, you don't have to stop at every shot of somebody crying. You can just move right on through that. And if you're a man, you know, guys in hockey masks don't attack you unless you're playing hockey. Then they may attack you. Michael Bolton, he doesn't live in our universe. Car mechanics tell you the truth. You can admire Clint Eastwood without starving yourself to death to look like him. You know, the gray hair and the wrinkles, <laughs> they only add to your character and they make you look a little more distinguished. Amen. You know, if another guy shows up at the party in the same outfit that you're wearing, you guys might just be lifelong buddies, okay? <laughs> and the occasional well-rendered belch, it's, well, practically expected. That's why we like being men. We can do all of those things. Today's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. I hope you enjoyed the donuts out in the, the, the Great Hall. And um, at the end of the service, if there's some out there and you're on your way out and you want to take one to the car, take it to the car, please. It'd be, make me happy if all those were gone after the service, okay? But on Father's Day, you know, the message sometimes uh, is often similar to a graduation speech. It's kind of like, you know, let's step it up, let's step it up, let's, let's man up, let's be strong, let's, let's be courageous. And, and I recognize that today may be difficult for some of you because maybe your, your father is no longer here. And we recognize that. Some of you may have a dad who deserted you, left you, and there are dads here today, probably, who, who feel discouraged. Maybe they've been dissed by their, their children. And, and, and others are delighted to be dads, but really don't want the attention that, that Father's Day brings. You know, I had a part, I had a part in raising five children. And they are all grown up and off our payroll <laughs> and out of the house. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Wait a minute, was that a little bit too exuberant? <laughs> now, I know that we have many new and first-time dads, fathers in this congregation, and, and over the years, I have learned a thing or two about raising kids, not that I am by any stretch of imagination an expert about raising children, but I do like to think that I've gained just a little bit of perspective over the last 35, 37 years. And this morning, I want to I boost our dads. I want to I lift them up and encourage them and, and help them to, to stay motivated in the journey that we call fatherhood. See, as a father, your role has great significance. Your role as a father has great significance. And you have a tremendous opportunity to impact your children in a way that no one else can. You may need some reassurance. You may need some inspiration for the path ahead. But you know, one of the greatest needs that we have in our nation, in our society today, is for our fathers, if they would stand up and assume their God-given role of responsibility in the family. Too many of them have shirked their responsibility. Too many of them have abdicated. They've left what they were supposed to do. And our text gives us some basic responsibilities 
for manhood. But when a man becomes a father, those responsibilities are greatly expanded. Let's look as we read Micah chapter 6. I just want to read verse 8, but I've got a lot of other scripture this morning. God's word says this. It says, he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Loving Father, as these words resonate in our hearts and in our minds, the things that you require, that we do justice, that we love mercy, and that we walk humbly with you. Father, I pray that that would be so in each of our lives. Not just the men, not just the fathers, but, but everyone. Father, that we would be doing these things. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak to our hearts, that you would bring peace with God to us, and Father, that we could have the peace of God because we have peace with God. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a few things that I wanted to point out about a godly father this morning. You know, I want, I want to say this first, that a godly father loves God. It seems kind of redundant to say that, but, you know, we have to begin with love because we're called to love even as Christ loves the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 25, Paul writes this, he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so we are, we are following Christ's example. Christ is the one who is leading. We are the ones following Christ's example as we relate to God, as we relate to our wife, as we relate to our children, our values, our integrity, even our own humility. We are following Christ's example. A, a godly father loves God. Matthew six thirty three. Oh man, I know this. I just can't recall it. Must be that age thing. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Folks, this is where it all begins. Seek first his righteousness and the rest of this will be taken care of. And, and you know, this is the basis upon which happiness is built and these are the priorities of those relationships that we have. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of the rest of this will be added to you. Listen, if you don't have a right relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, it is futile for you to think that you can relate properly to others. You see, if you don't have this relationship here in, in line like it's supposed to be, then this relationships won't be what they need to be. And so what I'm saying is you, you can't have, you, you have to have a right relationship with God in order for your relationships with others to be what they need to be. And I will say this, if you are running from God, if you are running away from God, you will never have peace. You will never have peace I mean, settle that matter once and for all. Isaiah 57, 21 says, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. For those who are running away from God, there is no peace. But listen, it, it, when you're struggling with being strong, maybe as a, as, a, as a dad, as a mom, you're struggling with being strong and you, you're caving instead of demonstrating courage, remember that you are surrounded completely by the presence of of Almighty God. I mean, God's presence will give you the power to do what he's called you to do. And you can have courage because of the character of God himself. He is the one who holds our commitments. He is the one who takes care of us. He is the one who provides. He is the one who gives us the air we breathe. 
It all comes from him. See, we are to submit to the purposes of God. As a father, as a, as a mother, as a, as a child of God, we are to submit to the purposes of God. We're to seize and take hold of the promises of God. We're to stand on those precepts of God, soak in the presence of God, but we're also called to stay on point with God. And this is huge because, fathers, I want to encourage you this morning, each one of you, to deepen your relationship with the Father, to deepen your relationship with God. You see, deep calls to deep. Ask God to help you, to enable you to lead your family in his ways. See, a godly father loves God. If you want to be a godly father, then you have to love God. I would also say that a godly father loves his wife. See, marriages, (laughs) marriages are not made for and they're not made in heaven oh it it sounds you know kind of uh, romantic to say that well this marriage was made in heaven this marriage is made for heaven it's not that way let me tell you marriage is designed to function on earth angels are different beings they're created differently family life is designed for human beings not angels See, when we talk about a man loving his wife, most husbands assume that love is, well, sex. They think that goes together. And while it does, it's certainly a part of love, but it's not all. Back in Ephesians 5, 25, it says this. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved the church and gave himself up for so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church folks when we're talking about love it's a lot more than what society wants to make it about it's a lot more than what Hollywood wants to make it about when you think about real love seeks to meet the needs of one another and we're in 1 Corinthians 13 we we read and we hear this a lot at weddings But it says this, it says, love is patient. (laughs) Ouch. Love is patient. Love is kind and not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. A godly husband loves his wife. In that way, patient, kind, not jealous, doesn't act unbecoming. See, that's a real definition for love. But listen, guys, romantic actions are not an abandonment of your manliness. Chivalry is not dead. Open the car door. Pull her chair out at dinner. Hold her hand. Help her make the beds. Clean out the tub when you're done. The list is endless. But the reality is, is that your sons are learning from you about how to treat their wives. That's heavy when you think about that. One day they will treat their wives the same way you treat their mother. That's where they get it. 
And you think about that, and it's a great example also to our daughters about how a man is supposed to treat a woman. See, in the husband's and wife relationship, guys need to be open with communication far more than we are. Most of us like to shut down. Most of us keep it held in. We need to foster open communication and strong communication and connections in our marriage, but also in the family unit. See, when we do this, we're helping to create an environment where everyone can grow in faith. Sitting down and talking with your son or daughter, spending some time with them. Another way that we love our wives is through forgiveness. Through forgiveness. I mean, we all need to give forgiveness. And we all need to receive forgiveness. We need both of those. We need to be able to give it. We need to be able to receive it. And folks, it is a beautiful picture of restoration when two married people forgive each other for offending wrongs. You know, 1 Peter chapter 3 Verse 7 has something to say about that. I want you to hear what I'm saying and not what I'm not saying here. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. As with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. You want to know something that God takes seriously? If we're not treating our wives the way we should, he might be like, Ridge, I'm not answering your prayer. My prayers are hindered because of my actions. So what we have to do here, your your prayers won't be hindered if you're treating her with understanding, if you're doing the things that you're supposed to be doing. But lastly, on, on loving his wife, I want to say this. this must also be, there must also be a clear oneness in the family unit with, between husband and wife. There is obvious unity between husband and wife. You know, in, in uh, Genesis 20, excuse me, 2, 24, it says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. You are no longer your own. You belong to each other. And I know this is, this is difficult, but we're, we're called to, to leave and cleave. And once this, the oneness is developed over a process of time, you know, each of us become one in soul and spirit and even in outlook. We have oneness in our goals. We have oneness in, in every way. And and I think that's huge because children in the home must see this oneness evidenced. It goes together. It needs to be evidenced in their parents. Thirdly, I would say this, a godly father loves his children. See, love is more than providing material things. Fathers, I just want to tell you, don't miss, do not miss your children's childhood. Put your stinking phone down. Turn the TV off. Go outside. Go do something with them. Because so much of what we see and witness today is not that. I mean, when discipline's required, do it in love. That's what Colossians 3.21 says. Fathers, don't uh, exasperate your children so that they don't lose heart. Don't just discipline them when you've had enough, you can't stand it anymore, and you're totally angry, okay? Be consistent in it. Do it it when you don't feel like it. Do it when you're tired. Be consistent in that, and and, and love your children and other folks (laughs) enough that you will discipline them. 
And there's certain things that only a father can say to their child. See, children interpret your time spent with them as love. Greatest day of their life, spending the time with their dad, with their mom, just going and doing. Forget quality time, forget quantity time, turn the TV off, turn the computer off, go outside and do something together outside. That is gonna mean more to your child than all of the time spent together watching TV. A godly father loves God and he loves his wife. He also loves his children and is also a man of integrity. Our text this morning says to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. You know, integrity... Integrity has become almost a forgotten word. I mean, the highest elected office in our land is tainted with the smell of corruption. We, as believers in Jesus Christ, are called to rise above that and be men and women, people of integrity. It should permeate every part of our lives. In the workplace, we need to give an honest day's work. In the home, we need to make sure that the the promises are fulfilled. In our personal business, prompt payment of our obligations. And in other relationships, I want to say we need to have a commitment to fulfill my commitments. It's pretty simple. Let me just boil it all down here. Just do what you say you're gonna do. Just do what you say you're going to do. Integrity is when what we say and what we do match up. If you say you're going to be somewhere at two o'clock in the afternoon, then be there at two. Because that's your commitment. That's the verbal commitment you made with somebody. But that's the problem. We don't see that integrity a lot in our world today. A godly father is also a role model of God. And now I know I'm going to be cutting real close to the corn here. The image of a father these days is not always a good one. Over half the children in America grow, out, grow up without a father in the home. They're often abandoned by their father or somehow their father is maligned. Sexual abuse by fathers is on the rise. Listen, when we, we then tell our children that God is like their heavenly father. Small wonder they're afraid of him. I mean, God help us. Dad, I know this sounds like a huge, big responsibility, but understand this today, that you are shaping your child's concept of his or her heavenly father, and they see you to be like him. They look at you and they think you are like him. So we need to walk a little plainer, daddy. We need to walk a little little closer to Christ. We need to walk a little closer to God. See, fathers need to be reinstated to the level of importance that God intended for them. In fact, I've seen strong evidence which points to the fact that the reason that American morality and spiritual integrity is at such an all-time low is because of the declining value placed on the role of the father in today's society. When we discount dads, when we discount fathers, when we say it doesn't matter what your dad says, 
And then we say, God is like your father. He's like your heavenly father. And what happens is, is they begin to, that, that projection is, is, is on you. And when dad is undervalued, so is the right relationship with Abba, our heavenly father. See, today my, my goal is not to remind our dads of their duties and responsibilities so much as it is to encourage them and remind us all of their importance. Children need a daddy. The respect and the dignity of the role of the father needs to be reinstated. I mean, families and, and fathers play an extremely important role and, and a vital role in our families today and I want to say in our nation as a whole. See, the word of God is encouraging us to be godly fathers and mothers today and every day. You know, when our children were growing up, we had a plaque with scripture on it It was posted right next to the front door on the inside. And on that plaque, it said, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So going in, coming out, there was a choice made. That quote that I quoted is found in Joshua 24, 15. And Joshua said this, he said, uh, Moses wrote this about Joshua, he said, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods of which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorite in whose land you are living, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But notice that a choice is required. Choose, choose this day. But the choice is very personal as well. Choose this day whom you will serve. Too many of us waver and hesitate and capitulate because we want to keep one foot in and one foot out. But spiritual indecision leads to disorientation, or say it another way, indifference will lead to indecision. If we don't think about it, if we don't make a choice, it leads to indecision. Check this out, as as Joshua is choosing to live out his faith, he's living out his faith for the sake of his family. It's as if he's saying, I have chosen to serve the Lord. And I am choosing to serve the Lord right now. And I'm going on serving the Lord in the future until the very end. I made this choice. And in the Hebrew, it literally reads, I myself am making this choice. He's determining that his faith will be lived out at home. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua, as the head of his household, declared, as for me and my house. And then he includes his household there because he's going to lead them in the right path. Don't miss this. Don't miss this, parents, grandparents. You can't pass something on to your children that you don't have yourself. That's what Joshua is saying. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Choose this day. I mean, Joshua is setting the the, the spiritual temperature in his home because he is the priest of his family. You know, studies have shown that the influence of a parent is two or three times more influential than any church program in passing along faith to the next generation. Folks, it starts at home. Now I'm remembering a famous painting (laughs) by Norman Rockwell. It appeared on the the cover of Saturday Evening Post and it, it shows a picture of a family going off to church 
And they're going through the living room and, and, and in, the, in the lead is, is the, the oldest sister. And she's dressed for church and behind her is her mom and she's dressed for church and the younger sister and she's dressed for church and they're all walking through the living room. And the son is behind them. And it seems like he's going with a little bit of reluctance because at the center of the picture, there's dear old dad slumped in a chair, still wearing his pajamas, reading the paper. And as Junior walks by, he casts a longing eye over at his father. He's going to church, but clearly he'd rather be with his dad. Fathers, as the point man in our homes, we have to lead our families. We have to lead them. I'm going to ask our worship team to come back up as I wrap this up. You know, today you may be a person who is living with a a father wound. Maybe your earthly father may have may have failed failed you, but I, I want to tell you this morning that God will not fail you. He promises to be the father that you always wanted and needed. And just as he opened the heavens to proclaim his love for his son Jesus, he will touch the pain in your heart. He will pour out love and mercy to heal your deepest wounds. This morning you may long to be a better father to your children. Follow the example of the Heavenly Father. Be present with your children physically and emotionally. Find creative ways to to lead your children so that they wouldn't trade you for anything in the world and let them know that you wouldn't trade them for anything in the world. I mean, God will help you to be present acknowledging, loving, affirming to your children. You know, today your heart may be burdened for many fatherless children living in your extended family. Maybe your church, maybe your, our community. But allow God's heart to become your heart. Find a child whom you can mentor and be a big brother, a surrogate dad or a grandpa to. And be there for them. Share your heart with with them and, and, and your heart that you have with God, your relationship. Let them know how valuable they are and how much God and you love them. See, there's no need to try to be a pro. Just showing up and being present in your kid's life is priceless. But remember, your prayers make a difference in the lives of the fatherless as well. So the time to refocus on fatherhood is now. By our Heavenly Father's wonderful grace, get active, make a difference. So as we move towards a time of response, I just wanna ask you this question, Dad, Will you deepen your relationship with God? And will you seek his guidance so that you can be a godly influence in your children's lives? Mom, will you deepen your relationship with God so that you can be a godly influence in the lives of your children? Student, Will you deepen your relationship with God and seek his guidance so that you can be a godly influence on those around you? We have a purpose. We have a mission. And I think we need to get about it before King Jesus returns. Would you pray with me? Loving Father, we thank you for this time. And God, you are so good to us. You have blessed us beyond measure. And Father, we fall short.